back in Greenville, Maine. It's about April 10th, 1995. Folsom's Air Service is putting a new door on the hangar. You expect it to be warm and cozy. It's a cold and rainy and snowy day. And there's still a foot and a half of snow on the ice. Spring is close, but it's not quite here yet. And where else do you see the Kadadin frozen in with a Christmas tree, Christmas tree on top still. I gotta sniff one of these chickens. Grab a chicken because Nancy's supposed to be bringing the dinner and uh, she hasn't done it yet. I'm with uh, Dwayne Lander chewing the chicken and Dick Folsom, Folsom's Air Service in Greenville, Maine. And we're gonna look at some old photographs from back who knows when, Dwayne. Uh, uh, well, Dick can tell us when. Um, you're, Dwayne Lander is one of the gentlemen, along with the Folsom crew, that started the international seaplane flying. And Dick stopped, or Dwayne stopped by tonight and so we can talk to Dick. And uh, D Dwayne, if you would, try to pull some history out of uh, Dick for me. Well, I just asked Dick a second ago how many hours he had flying, but when did you get started, Dick, in the flying business here at Moosehead? Moosehead, uh, 46. Started with a rocket champ. Is that after were you were involved in flying in the service? I was a mechanic. I worked for Pratt and Whitney, Pan American Airways, and three and a half years in the Army Air Corps. Uh, Did you fly uh, here I on Moose Head? I flew on planes, so I'm not as pilot. I learned to fly in 1941 at Pratt and Whitney Flying Club, but I never, I never really got my private license till 40, spring of '46. When did you start the uh, seaplane operation here in Greenville? 40, seaplanes '47. I worked on um, on airplanes for another flying service here, the summer of '46. And I started commercial flying in 47. You started all alone? Just you, yourself? Yeah, well, three of us bought the brand new Aronka Champ in January, I go about February, March, 46. And the next year I put it on floats, 47. <clears throat> what was the primary was use? A real, real hot performer, 65 horse with a wooden prop on it, on floats. <laughs> What was the primary use of the float plane? Was it strictly fishing camps, fishermen, or was it sightseers? Well, it started off uh, more or less scenic flights, and then I worked in a, some charter with it, and started to get out of hand. We really got quite a bit of business. Fact is, we got more than I could handle. I used to go hide, so I wouldn't have to go out again sometimes in '47. <laughs> And uh, 48, I got a PA-12 on floats, which was a dog. The first ones that came out with 100 horsepower, you can imagine. And they had a kit you put in them. You're supposed to get 108 horse with a aromatic prop, which you had to tinker with all the time to get it to work right. And uh, I had the first. Macaulay metal prop for a 65 horse champ in the state is Nancy now. It was like adding 10 horsepower to it. Was your operation right here at this present location, Dick, when you started? No, or? we were down on the wharf where the Katahdin is now, close to the town. I see, yeah. I was down there till 52. I bought this lot up here from Hollis Crowley and we moved up here. And Hollis used this for the flying service? Uh, he had a flying service here, and I, uh, what happened anyway? He wasn't doing much, so he moved into Chamberlain Lake and sold this place to me. You've been right here There's a ever big since. red barn down here. You've probably seen pictures. Yeah. We tore that down. Come in. Come on in. Hi, Nancy. Let's get over here. Good evening. 
You said you started, Dick, down where the Katahdin is down now on the end of the cove. When did you move up to this location? Uh, 51, I think. How many airplanes did you have at that, when you moved up here? Did you? Uh, I had a uh, Aronka sedan and a 90 horsepower champ. Who did you have working with you? Uh, Andy Stinson. Andy Stinson? Yeah, Andy was with me from 47 to 56. Then he got a chance to go to the fishing game. It was a better deal. Andy's still flying now? Yeah. He's doing mechanical work down to Old Town. He's still, he's still flying. He still has his class 2 medical. He's about 74 now. Hmm. How about Charlie Cole? When did he come on board? Charlie, 56. He was here till, well, till last year. Hmm. And Charlie came out of the military right to here? Or? No, he, uh, he uh, worked for my, for Ray O'Donnell, who had a flying service here at the time I started up. That's when I first met him. And, uh, then he left there and he instructed down to Waterville. And uh, then he went to work for the forestry. And uh, he resigned his job with the forestry and came to work for me in 56. In all the years of flying, do you have any one particular story that you like to tell? That's, you know, there's got to be quite a few. So where do you, where do you start? Which one do you pick? I don't like to tell any of them. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it's something, what do they call this, Duane? After four years goes by, you can't be held responsible? That's right. <laughs> That's the word for that? So you, you can pass it on. What are some of the uh, real exciting experiences you've had, Dick? Uh, I know you had uh, one kind of an odd experience here on Moosehead Lake. Oh, yeah. Yeah, landing in the trees on Sugar Island. We are cycling around about. 200 feet looking for moose and the engine stopped just like that and uh, I was right in the middle of the island it's about a mile long about a mile wide five miles long and uh, if I'd have had another hundred feet I could have made it to the lake but I, I didn't so I landed right in the, in the trees big how, maples how'd you land so gentle I just, just brought it in just above stall, flew right into the trees. Real soft, I couldn't believe it. it uh, you could hear the branches cracking and everything, and just before we hit, why, I just went like this, you know, and, and all at once felt a little jolt like that. I thought, oh, hell, we're hanging up in the tree, how are we going to get out of here? So I looked out the, through the windshield and looked right straight down into the ground. It was, the plane was nose down into the ground. And nobody got a scratch. It was just before dark. So we walked out to the shore and of course we didn't get back. We'd been up to Casey's and had a big feed of beans. There was four of us in it. How'd you get back? Well, uh, when they missed us, why they, everybody went out looking, and uh, they couldn't find a plane anywhere until we got out to the shore. About dark, we built a fire on the shore, and then they spotted us. And Otis Gray came up with a forestry helicopter. No, the game wardens came up and hauled us over to Deer Island, over to Capins, and then Otis picked us up with a helicopter. What happened, I guess, I was hoping they'd find something wrong with the engine, but we couldn't find anything wrong with it. it, was, it were, the engine ran out of fuel, but that was before the AD came out on the Cessna gas tanks, where uh, they would, uh, wrinkles would form in them, and it would, uh, if the wrinkle formed under the float or something on the gas tank, it would show you had more gas than you did. And it would make kind of a pocket. And once you used up the gas in that pocket, there was gas on the other side of it. 
but you ran out of gas. I was low on gas, but I wasn't out of gas. Of course, everybody likes to tease me about running out of <laughs> gas. <but. laughs> I did, in a way. I probably shouldn't have been so low, but, you know, just that's what happened. Now, was the actual nose of the plane touching the ground after it the went floats, through the trees? Yeah. It didn't totally airplane. Max came in and looked at it, boy, he said, what a neat crash. <laughs> And, uh, the plane's flying now, it was repaired. So I can say I've never totaled an airplane. <laughs> that was near it, but not quite. That, uh, how, how many other times have you uh, The worst experience a... I ever had was going through the ice, 10 below zero, night before Christmas, up to Forest Park. Landed on skis and dropped through? No, it was on wheels. That was froze up late that year, like it did this year. Frank Jardine called, wanted me to come get him. I really didn't want to go, but I can be talked into things. That's one of my failings, and <laughs> one, of the, one of the many. So I did, agreed to go up. He, he, I had him cut some holes in the ice, but not knowing much about flying, he didn't cut it out far enough. And there was a strong wind blowing from the west. So I picked him up, I got in all right. Started to cut out, taxi out, where he'd cut the holes. We come to the end of where he had checked the ice. And uh, I didn't think there was room enough to get over the trees, turn and go back to it, Forest Park. I said, geez, I don't think I got room enough to get over the trees, even though there was a pretty good wind. So I said, well, what do you think about the ice if we taxi further out? Well, he said, it froze at the same time. It's probably about the same. Jeez, I didn't go 50 feet for a Down we went. <laughs> so, jeez, I opened. When I, when the minute that broke through, because I knew what happened, well, I opened the door and jumped out through the door. And uh, I got onto the ice. The ice was strong enough to hold a person. So I shot out through the door, Frank was right behind me, and I got up on top of the ice and helped him out. As I say, we were about a half a mile from camp, probably, a little more, ten below zero. And by the time we got to, back to camp, our clothes was all froze stiff. And so that was a, that's probably the closest ex experience that I had. Did you spend the night there? Yeah, I still spent the night, and he had a, <clears throat> what they call a, well, they call it a jitterbug. It was a plain fuselage on skis. You know, they froze enough. The lake was frozen, but it wasn't very solid. That night it was so cold that we we went down with the, to Lily Bay with the, uh, so they call it the jitterbug there or something. What am I looking at here, Dick? That's uh, Don Broadhead's Luscombe was tied at the wharf. That happened in the fall. And uh, just a big gust of wind picked it right up and set it on top of that box then on the wharf. Dick, of all the flying you've done, the thousands of hours in the air, have you ever had a plane fail on you mechanically? Yeah. You've got one. The only one I can think of was a Cessna 175 taken off from Jackman in the spring. I just got off the ground and it just quit cold and uh, didn't have uh, room to stop for the end of the runway. So we, I hit a snow bank at the end of the runway, just bounced up on its nose. And as I remember, I think it bent the prop. but. As we could tell, setting all window there, condensation or something, there was water in the carburetor bowl. Or somehow or other, it just got into the jets or something, the engine stopped, the carburetor jet. That's the only thing we could figure. We, after it warmed up and thawed out, oh, later on we drained the carburetor and there was water in the bowl. So, But there was nothing mechanically wrong with the engine. It, just, I think it was just accumulation of condensation. Okay. 
Uh, this was taken when I trapped with a fellow by the name of Thon Nishman for three winters back in the early 50s, 49, 50, 51. So we stopped in to visit a friend of mine, Forrest Smith, who had a camp at Ragged Lake. He lived at Ragged Lake. And this is some of the furs he caught. And that machine there is his motor toboggan, the uh, forerunner of the snowmobile, I guess. Okay, Dick, who's this? Okay, that's Andy Stinson pouring a drink over to Wilson Pond. That's my first pilot. He worked for me for eight years until 50, until 56. I'm looking at a camp here. Where is this camp? What's it about? That's a Moise Salmon Club on the Moise River, Seven Islands, Quebec. We flew out of that for about a month every year for, uh, usually from the middle of June to the middle of July. One of the best salmon rivers in the world. Taken on the Moise River in Canada, and that's a Ronca Sedan. That was taken about early 50s, excuse me, early 50s. Those salmon probably go over 30 pounds, 30, 35 pounds. Oh uh, yeah, this is a upriver tent camp we had on the Moise, about 30 miles above the main camp, and very good fishing up there. That's myself on the left, and Mitch Campbell, he was the superintendent of the camp, the guy on the right. Dick, what's this picture about? Uh, this was taken at Squaw Lake in Labrador, up near Shefferville. And uh, it was taken around 55, 56. Uh, that's a Cessna 180 there. And we were repairing a crack in the oil pan. We lost most of our oil on the way up. And we finally got into Shefferville after borrowing making some emergency patches on the oil pan. And uh, I pulled the oil pan off and uh, got a mechanic there at the Squaw Base, Squaw Lake Seaplane Base to river, uh, bolt a patch on it so we could get back. Dick, is this one of the first airplanes you had on skis? No, no. First Beaver I had on skis. That's on straight skis there, but my first set of skis on the Beaver were hydraulic retractable skis. And uh, we bought these skis. I don't know where we got them now, but we just put them on there to see how they'd go. And we never really flew it much on them. That's uh, Ronka's champ when I was flying the mail to Chisuncook. The picture's taken at Chisuncook. What year? Oh, mid-50s. Okay. Oh, that's a snow sled driven by an airplane engine. Actually, it's a, uh, it was an airplane fuselage, but it's running backwards. You've got to push a prop on it. The tail is to the left. Well, it'd be the front of it's to the left. And of course, on an airplane, it was the other way around. That's Hank Garvin. He's one of the game wardens here 40 years ago. Who is this, Dick? Oh, that's Charlie Cole. He flew for me for 26 years, but that's before he came to work for me. He was flying for the Forest Service. Okay, that's Archie Ricker, one of my first instructors. He used to run a steamroller, taught himself to read and write. And he was a, one of the best instructors I ever had. Uh, that's, uh, that's Bill Turgeon on the right. He's the first uh, flying game warden in the state of Maine. And with him is George Later, who was a ground warden then, but uh, he later became chief pilot and one of my best friends. Now? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, this is a uh, trapper by the name of Zabo. He was missing for three weeks, and we were out on a search for him with a half a dozen airplanes, and uh, when it was found uh, on Braley Brook, it was uh, up on the shore, and it hit a wing, it hit a tree, and he was laying in front of it dead, and we think that he, uh, he tried to jump out and stop the plane. I think he landed on glare ice, 
and uh, the prop was still spinning, hit his head, and he was laying in front of the plane. Uh, yeah, that's the pilot, the uh, trapper, laying in front of the airplane as we found him. He was under the snow, that's the snow was brushed off. And we loaded him in a PA-12 and flew him out. I say we, the Wardens did it, I was there, but... Yeah, that, that fella, the wind blew him over on uh, Holib Pond up beyond Jackman, just before freeze-up in the fall. And we had to wait till the ice got solid enough to, it was frozen in with just the float sticking out. So we had to saw around it and I put a pole up and put a, with a chain falls on it. And uh, we timed it so a bunch of fellas would fly in about the time we figured we were ready to pull it out. And uh, we lifted it out of the water, backed it back on the ice and took it apart. And uh, we, uh, I guess we, I think we shipped it to Jackman on the train. The train went right by the pond, CP, Canadian Pacific train. That was quite a project. <laughs> we rebuilt it. That's a British uh, Royal Marines helicopter. They were training over in New Brunswick and two of them landed here in the yard. Uh, I think we fueled them up and they went back to New Brunswick. Okay, that's Jasper Haynes on the left. He's quite a well-known trapper and he trapped with a cub in the winter. And uh, the guy on the right is uh, Lloyd Clark from Millinocket. They presented a beaver coat to Mamie Eisenhower. That'd be back in the mid-50s sometime, I guess. Oh, that's a Navy amphibian that Jim Butler, one of my pilots, was in the Navy, used to fly. And he went off from a ramp with one wheel and tipped her up on one side. That's about it, I guess. <laughs> what kind of plane was it? Any idea? It's a, well, some kind of an amphib. I'm not sure what it was. Doesn't look like an albatross, but some kind of an amphibian. Dwayne, do you know what it is? I don't recognize no, it. No, I don't. Yeah, that's my uh, my beaver, the original color it was when we bought it. It's taken about 59 or 60 probably. And had 2,000 hours on it when we bought it. Now has 14,000 hours on it. Well, that's a Cessna 180 that the uh, fellow was cranking by hand. The throttle happened to be open and uh, the ignition on and uh, it started. He jumped out of the way and the plane crashed into the hangar. It's since been repaired and it's still flying. It's around here somewhere. Uh, that's the same Bernard. Nobody could lift him in the plane so we had him walk the plank up into the plane and flew him to Cessuncook. He weighed about 150 pounds. What, what is this tent site here? Oh, that's a tent camp we had into Allagash Lake for a few years back in the 50s. Oh, that's Charlie Coe, Warren Maddox, getting ready to go to Pine Pond and uh, with a load of a uh, typical load with a canoe and a bunch of junk. Yeah, well, that's a beaver with a Naronka sedan wing on it. A sedan cracked up in Cooper Pond over toward Millinocket, and I flew the wing out. Didn't fly that good either. Yeah, well, this was normal snow <clears throat> 10 or 15 years ago. We don't seem to have those storms anymore. Now, that's our beaver. We were rigging the first water dropper that was used in the state of Maine. I think that's, uh, oh, that's our mechanic, Clayton Lubia, standing on it. Yeah, well, that's a brand new Cessna 206 Amphib landed with the wheels down in the water, and uh, we went over there. That's near Halton. We went over there and pulled it out of the water and flew it back here to Greenville and repaired it. That's Max sitting on a float. Uh, that's a Taylor craft from uh, Middle Dam over in the Rangeley area. 
And that's a fellow that invented a spring affair that goes on the struts, so it's supposed to ride better in rough air. I don't know whatever happened to it. Yeah, I think that's, uh, well, that's our first helicopter. I don't know who that is in it, tell you the truth. I don't would even you, know who's flying it. What did you use the machine for? Just rides or? Yeah, I don't know. We used it for other things. Uh, that's George Grinnell from Deary, New Hampshire. He's been around, flying around here for 35 years and quite a character. Yeah, that's pulling out. I, I think that's a 172 that the wind blew over out here on the lake that we were salvaging down on the wharf. Is there no more pictures of that? Yeah. And there's one more, I think, of that. Move your hand a little bit away. Okay, thank you. Dick, That's is this one of the hazards of window flying? Oh, yeah, it's a hazard, all right. That's a 170. I think his brake failed and he went over the snowbank at the airport. Yeah, that's a helicopter that I was trying to pick up some people at, uh, before the ice went out at, at Horseshoe Pond. I went to back away from the wharf and hit the tail rotor in the water. And she started to spin around and I had to dump it in the water. So then we went in and fixed it up and, and there was no uh, space to fly it out of. So we built this float to put it on it and flew it off that float. Yeah, well, that's a beach D-18 we had here for about five years. My son Rodney standing on the float. Good machine, or yeah, it was a good. It's a good seaplane. Good performer. Yeah. Okay, that was taken in Canada near the Moise River, about 1957. Those uh, mostly lake trout. Might have been one or two speckled trout there. Is that you, Dick? That's me when I was a little younger. <laughs> Who's this now? Telford? What the heck is that funny? Is that a double exposure or what is that? I don't think so. No? No. It's, it's you and Telford? Yeah, but it looks like there's something else in the back of it there. It's a paint scheme. Huh? It's a paint scheme. Oh no, it does look, I don't something know. Is, is, something's wrong. I think it's a double exposure of some kind, but you, you still want to use it? Sure, Who, who's, who's, who's okay. with you? Okay. Who's with you? Well, it's Telford, isn't it, on the right? Yeah. I don't know who the other guy is. That's over to North New Portland, I think. We were over there hopping passengers at the fair. That's myself and Telford Allen on the right. Dick, is this one of the airplanes you use for water bombing? Well, not really. It's a Canadian water dropper they used to show off at the fly-in. Who's this, Dick? Yeah, well, this picture was taken at the Moise Salmon Club. Myself and uh, one of the cooks there on the Moise River, Seven Islands, Quebec. What kind of club is that? Oh, it's a salmon fishing club, very exclusive club, and uh, we si we uh, flew there for about 15 years, I guess, one month during the summer. That's uh, some of the camps up uh, river from the Moise Salmon Club. I used to fly between these camps and the main camps, 16 miles down river. Yeah, that's a Cessna 185 on the takeoff dolly, getting ready to tow it down the runway and take off. Does that work very well? How fast do you have to oh, go? Oh, yeah. Oh, we get going about, we usually get going about 60 and pop it off. It's really pretty simple. Yeah, that's Otis Gray with the, with the forestry helicopter trying to fly my... Uh, 185 to Greenville, but it wouldn't, didn't quite want to do it. It would lift it, but he didn't want to haul it. It was a little too heavy. Who's this, Dick? 
Uh, that's Don Folsom, my cousin, my brother in the middle, and me making the face on the right. What? Any idea what year it was? <laughs> oh, geez, I don't know. It was about 65 years ago. It's, uh, maybe not that long ago, 60 years ago. Dick, this is uh, 1995. How have things changed so on the edge of wilderness since you started back in 46? Well, right now they're cutting down all the trees and there's a lot of throat to put near every pond or within a <clears throat> short distance of it. Fishing isn't as good, the hunting isn't as good. Well, anyway, nothing's as good. <laughs> what, what happened to the fishing? Why is it slower? Uh, I don't know. Just, well, so many roads they can get into these places and fish them more. I'm no authority on it. I don't, I don't really know all the story about it, but every place is good fishing. You know, they concentrate on it. Pretty soon, it's not good fishing. Let's talk about airplanes. Cessna is not making them yet. If you had to buy an airplane today for your kind of work, what would you get? Another Beaver? <clears throat> you mean what model plane? Yeah. What type of plane would you use? Uh, I like the 206 pretty well, Cessna 206 or 185. 206 is pretty good seaplane. Dick, when you got going, there were a lot of bush pilots around and, and sea pilots, but seaplane pilots were coming onto the scene. What's the difference between a bush pilot and a seaplane pilot? Well, there's good seaplane pilots, but they aren't used to flying refrigerators and canoes and dead bodies and <laughs> whatnot. You know, and it takes a while to to break one in. You know, to fly in small ponds and stuff like that. It's just a little different. I'm not saying there aren't good seaplane pilots, but it's really hard to find a, a good bush pilot. Where do you go to find one? Mainly, today? there's not enough enough of it. You know, well, some in Alaska, Minnesota, probably. And, Upstate New York, guys like Herb Helms. How do you get experience these days? How does a young person start off these days? Well, it's going to be tough. No, we, we like to, we've had pretty good luck uh, just taking a young guy in here and uh, like Telford Allen, learn to fly here and turned out to be a great pilot. And uh, some didn't turn out so good. <laughs> Where's Telford today? Oh, he's got a fleet of, of uh, caravans and doing a lot of several UPS routes. He's flying a Hawker 700 right now. And he's operating the Waterville Airport. And he flies out of Palm Beach in the wintertime with the Hawker. Recap for me again. What year you started flying commercial service here in Greenville, Maine? 1946. Would you, do, would you do it all over again? Not now, I don't think. <laughs> but it had to be exciting in those days. Airplanes were new. Float plane flying was new. It wasn't new, really. There's been float planes here since the 30s. It was, it was pretty near all, since I was a kid, there's been a seaplane here in the summertime. <clears throat> An old Stinson Reliant, a Waco or something, or a Curtis Robin. Dick, uh, where's the business headed? You've passed the, the business over to one of your family members? <laughs> yeah, well, Max took it over about eight years ago, and I'm just the flunky around here now. What's <clears> exciting in the business? Actually, the mechanical work is real good. The flying, the flying stays about the same, 15, 1,600 hours a year we fly. Few students. It's different, though. You don't have as many hunters. <coughs> excuse me. There's many hunters and fishermen now, but we do a lot of flying. Uh, we usually have a twin available. Max flies into Boston, New York. Uh, we'll go anywhere you want to go, but uh, it's changed. We meet the airline at Bangor a lot. People just fly into the camps, the cottages, and things like that. The, uh, there's really not as many fishermen and hunters flying now. Mainly because you can drive almost everywhere. 
they fly into the places that it takes three hours to drive to that we can fly in in half an hour. I mean, they'll do that a lot, quite a lot. Tell me about the DC-3. Where did the floats come from? <clears throat> well, we found the floats in uh, Dallas, Texas. Uh, some old guy had them in his backyard. And uh, took, we took two low bids to haul them up here. Cost us more to get them here than it did to buy them. And it was only the floats, there were no attachments or anything with them. We had to have all that stuff made. Did he say where he came, where he, where he found the floats at, the guy that you bought them from? Well, yeah, I think they had a, something like 11 pair, the army, or somebody had them stored in Oklahoma City. <clears throat> they melted them all down except one pair, and this is the only pair left in the world that we have. How'd the guy you, buy, you bought them from, how did he come about them? I really don't know how okay. he came about them. No. And how long did it take to get the parts made and the whole plane put together? Well, we were four years before we got it flying from the time we started. But a lot of it was waiting to have parts made. and There was really a lot of work to it. It cost us four or five times as much as we thought it was going to before we started it. And uh, we got to the point of no return. We got so much in it, we had to keep going. But probably looking back at it, we probably shouldn't have done it. I don't know, but it's been a lot of fun, really. Where's the plane today? All well, right now it's at Lakeland, Florida, down to Sun and Fun. <clears throat> we'll probably bring it up to the seaplane fly-in in September if we don't sell it, which we'd like to do. This you don't see very often. This was a tame deer they had here. And I've never seen a deer stand up on his back feet like that before. They said he could balance pretty good as they fed him. Here's some more of the storm that went through, took all the airplanes on the dock, and flipped them upside down. This is brand new uh, 206, he said. And it was a 172. And at the other dock, it got flipped up. Well, this is one of the ways to straighten out a spreader bar if it gets bent. Find two trees, stick it in between, get a bunch of people, bend it till it's straight. I can't tell what it, what it is. I think it's. Cessna, maybe it's a mall, Cessna. It took off from their backyard. I want to tell you, it's a pretty short stretch. Sometimes the recoveries are done by helicopter. I guess it was too far out in the lake. And other times, they're close enough to shore. This is Dick Folsom back in the 1940s, I believe. You're looking at a copy of a 1941 flying and popular aviation. I thought we'd go through it a little bit because I haven't seen one of these before. Let's do a quick phone tour here.
Here's a 1943 ad for Edo floats. And I don't know what these are. They look like little submarines or something. Maybe they're floats to attach to. I still haven't figured it out. This is October 1943. It's right in the middle of things. So we'll kind of pull the pages down. It's a pretty thick book in those days. And what is this? Get the pages to lay down. That's what kind of full plane this is. heard of it. Heath. Yeah. Let's turn on here. 